This afternoon starts off with a session on effective access to justice and representation for individuals with FASD as defendants, witnesses, and victims. It's a, it's a big um, topic. We're going to cover as much as we can, and as, you, as you've noticed, this conference is like a buffet. A little bit of this, a little bit of this, and a little bit of that. Ideally, we have two or three days, we don't. So don't get frustrated with the fact that you've just got a little bit of this and a little bit of that. The idea is to inspire and pull together all the diverse elements of FASD and the, and the multidisciplinary response. So this afternoon, panel three includes a, a wonderful, diverse group of experts. We start off with Justin Shepard, who, and I'm going to introduce each person just before they speak, because if you're anything like me, you cannot remember a thing later. So I will do a short intro just before they speak. Um, without effective access to justice, without effective representation, that is informed representation, people cannot have justice. I want to ask Judge Anderson, yes, Judge Larry Anderson, to come up because just before lunch, he told me uh, about a case. If you would come forward, please, Judge Anderson. Um, that bring, that exemplifies what happens to lawyers? Yes, yes, okay. Uh, no, I don't think that one, yes. Will it, is, it, is it working? What happens to lawyers who are not prepared? What happens to lawyers who are uninformed? The nightmare for lawyers is to be embarrassed in court, in front of their peers, their colleagues. And so Judge Anderson will give us a very short, brief um, snippet of what happened two weeks ago. A little while ago. A little while ago, very recently, in court where people weren't informed. I think, I think the real question is what happens to the accused with their lawyer isn't particularly prepared or informed. But anyway, uh, just a really quick, uh, quick uh, anecdote. Um, a relatively young woman of Indigenous descent pled guilty to the offence of possessing a restricted firearm with ammunition which was found in a duffel bag in the passenger well of a vehicle where she happened to be a passenger. Uh, I'm to this day convinced it was not her bag, uh, it was probably the driver's bag, but in any event she entered a guilty plea to the offence of, uh, of possessing uh, that. Uh, that's taken pretty seriously in Canada, and there is a mandatory three-year minimum jail sentence, although that's been struck down constitutionally, and so there is a possibility of a person getting a sentence that might be served in the community if it's less than two years. Um, and so, anyway, the guilty plea was entered, a report was ordered. Uh, the, I didn't hear much beyond the facts initially. Went over for six months or so. The report had some... Um, discrepancies in it. Uh, the lawyers, uh, they fought quite a bit over what the, these discrepancies in the person's background were, but they were really immaterial. Um, and th this is an individual who had a, a very challenging upbringing. She was born in jail. She was apprehended and put into foster care at a relatively young age. She suffered abuse, all kinds of a, a, a troubled uh, childhood. Um, and. Um, you know, she fell in with obviously uh, some some others who were um, criminally oriented, and and she ended up finding herself in this position where now she is facing a very serious charge. So she's out on bail for a period of time, then she fails to show up for sentencing, and she's on the lam for a while. Ultimately, is apprehended, and then um, I, I actually kept her in jail for a little while longer so that she would ensure that she would show up, but also. She had a very, what was apparent from the report, she had a very severe addiction to both alcohol and other various substances. So after, you know, this case now has gone on for, for a year or so, I hear about two hours of submissions between the lawyers and it's very clinical and I've heard all about the objectives of sentencing and uh, blah, 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 the kinds of stuff that, you know, lawyers talk about in, in the sentencing process. Um, and. 
you know i'm thinking as i and i mean i've kind of made up my mind by this time she's not going to jail but i wasn't being given anything from the lawyers that would give me a basis to make it you know to 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 make that ruling which would survive in the court of appeal um so i was handed some materials kind of perfunctorily by the lawyer in the course of the submissions i didn't really have a chance to um to look at them i knew i was going to have to break to think about the decision anyway and so after all of that you know um the lawyers have and and they've gone through all the case law and what not um you know i you know i i know she's got she's got addiction issues um and i know about her background um but i'm i'm um i'm quickly looking through the documents that are being submitted which show the kinds of initial things that she's been engaged in in jail and you know she's really devoted herself to rehabilitative to rehabilitative steps and i look at one of the documents and it says it's a certificate for participation in the FASD circle has anybody spoken about FASD in the 12 months that they've had this no and so i start i ask her to tell me about herself and specifically i start questioning her about this FASD participation well she had been diagnosed with FASD from a, from an early age um i didn't of course see the report because nobody thought to actually mention it and um and she then became engaged and we had this conversation um where she talked about her life generally and specifically as it relates to having FASD and by the end of it um the prosecutor who was pounding the table for 3 years in a penitentiary stands up and says i'm changing my position <laughs> i'm not opposed to her receiving a conditional sentence order but the point of this is um i i certainly did um hopefully somewhat kindly let counsel know how unimpressed i was with the advocacy that had been uh, presented um but you know it but for almost happenstance like she, she there was 3 years of her life on the line there <laughs> that could just as easily have gone in the complete opposite direction because the lawyer had really never thought to ask the question um about FASD so anyway that was the story that i <laughs> was shared and um you know i i guess it just really does go to emphasize how important it is um for there to be proper representation because the court is dependent upon the information that's given uh to them and they can't uh, can't do it without that that input so thanks thank you thank you very much judge anderson um yes and it's not all about the lawyers is it it's about the the victims and the defendants our first speaker is justin shepherd um justin was diagnosed with fasd at age 41 um he has a bfa a bachelor in fine arts and performing arts from western washington university um and he's made a film about fasd awareness um he speaks on numerous panels and at conferences um and uh he has is involved with the fasd project which takes him across the us um and he has recently been invited to become a member of the adult leadership collaborative um the change fasd change makers which is a group of people with who have been diagnosed with fasd and justin's going to open up by giving us an an idea of um a short idea of how um fasd diagnosis uh makes a difference and the experience of those with FASD in the criminal justice system. Thank you, Justin. Thank you. Thank you for having me here everybody. Um I'm going to jump right into this and um open up with some 
you know, something that's very important to me. I am part of the change makers. Um, and there should be another one of the change makers here with me on the stage who's also named Justin, Justin Mitchell. The reason he's not is because he is in jail. Justin has also been more than once convicted and found guilty of a crime that he did not commit. So we're going to go through some slides here and, you know, I, I think it's important as we talk about what we're here for with this conference and laying different frameworks out for FASD as a whole. Frameworks including public education, the legal system, um, how we, the medical system, and how we address all of these things with individuals towards FASD. Um, as mentioned, I myself, a little background on me, part of the reason I sought a diagnosis was part of, partially because of I have a criminal record myself. And I just assumed that everybody had been arrested 10 times and gone to jail a few times. Come to find out, that's not the case for everybody. Um, so that's part of the reason, and that helps me look back and understand myself better, right? And understand that um, while memory may have played a part in some of my interactions with police, more so oppositional defiance and not understanding what was happening in the moment and being able to process it properly made a huge difference in me going to the police station versus being let go or even handcuffed in the first place. So there has to be a completely different approach for individuals with FASD. And it does not just start with police, as we might all think it does. In the US, um, having toured around making the film and talking with youth and individuals living with FASD, I believe it starts in our school systems. Very young, right? There's a, we have a very punitive approach towards um, bad behavior, quote unquote. And as what's happening next door with memory, you know, and the talks that we give, that's an interpretation that is seen by maybe neurotypical people, police, whatever, that we're choosing this, when in reality, it's the way that our brain processes information differently and the way that we store memory. It causes what looks to the outward world like that we're being bad or that we're choosing a behavior when in reality, we don't have those choices. So I think it's important to keep those few tenets in mind as we move forward talking about um, individuals with FASD and the criminal justice system. Um, okay, so look at this slide here. <clears throat> Take note of the yellow. Um, of 98 participants, 30% were charged with a crime they did not commit. 30%. I mean, that's astounding to me. Uh, like, if you even look at the amount of people that are charged with crimes that they did not commit, and then you go inside of that even further for individuals living with this, this is because of the suggestibility, because of coercion, because of memory issues. These are the things that have to be remembered by lawyers and judges and police, right? Because that's what it is where it starts, right? So an understanding of this can help get these numbers down significantly. Just an understanding that someone's sitting in a room saying, well, what do you mean you don't remember? I don't remember if I put pants on sometimes. I don't remember where I was, no, at 2 o'clock. You know what I mean? And I say that jokingly, but I mean, literally, you have to understand the memory deficit is a huge part of the legal um, system. Um, I'm just going to keep skimming through these. Have never been believed by police. Um, and we spend a lot of time talking about um, individuals with FASD being perpetrators. And maybe not enough time uh, on the converse issue, which is how much are we victims of crime? And then you look at that and, and you see there, 77% feel they have never been believed uh, by police or have, have experienced not being believed by police. So therefore, they don't report the crime and it never gets sought out or taken care of. Have you ever been involved with justice as a person charged or as a victim of crime, as a witness to a crime? Did you understand the process? Here's the crux of it all. 
65% said no. I didn't understand the process. And that's because our process doesn't take the time to understand us. We are victims of the process. So we need special implementation, special, um, uh, just a whole different approach towards how we are treated within the system. When I made the FASD project, I interviewed Justice Joe Burkett of the Second Appellate District, and uh, he's a Supreme Court Justice. And he said with his own words, FASD needs its own legal system, its own legal framework, a completely different approach, perhaps even a stay of trial while you're reaching a diagnosis so that there can be a whole different approach towards getting fair treatment, especially when it's known that you have memory issues, that you are vulnerable to being coerced, that um, all of these things can lead to, and also people with FASD can be in the wrong space at the wrong time. Thank you. I also ran numbers when I was making the FASD project about the imprisonment numbers and how much tax money we're spending on it. How many people don't need to be in there? How many people could be giving back to society and being productive parts of society that shouldn't even be in there in the first place? And the numbers are astounding. Um, and so starting that from there and working backwards, we're already there. We already have people that are filling our up, probably somewhere at least around 50% of individuals will have experienced jail time or prison time in their life. And then to, we don't know the exact numbers, but they know in Canada, they did run a study that over 40% of people imprisoned have an FASD, 40%. Apply that to US numbers. I don't even know how many people are imprisoned, but it is a lot. And without being able to train police officers, our next line of defense for ourselves where we need help is the legal system, our justice system. And in order for that to change, there has to be an understanding, there has to be awareness around this disability because it is unique unto itself. In the way that we are approached, the way that we're fed through the system, and I think that there can be great change if we start moving away from being punitive. It's, it starts with removing stigma, and viewing us as bad people or bad kids. A lot of, if you talk to youth living with FASD, they'll tell you, I get labeled as the bad kid. I'm the troublemaker. That goes on, then they get punished for that. Even though it's not a choice, remember. It's their memory that's being perceived as behavior. So it starts in public education, it goes on, and um, people that, run into police have oppositional defiance disorder as i stated before and you know that's another area where cops can be trained as and implemented and i think that the legal system can also help in that area um as i'm going to use my home city of denver as an example they implemented a team response that is not police it is a psychiatrist a nurse and i'm not sure what the other two people are but there's a team of four people and they were sent on over 700 calls where there was no injuries and very, very few, less than 10% arrests. They were able to work out these problems in real time. So I think that that's not just needed for people with FASD. I think that's needed in general um, as police response can cause a reaction. But once we get past that, we have to lay a new framework in the legal system for disability and for individuals with FASD. Thank you so much for having me today. Thank you, thank you, Justin, because you bring um, a unique um, and very close view of the system to us. Um, the next speaker is Natalie Novick-Brown, um, and she is a licensed clinical forensic psychologist based in Washington State. Um, and her formal training includes a PhD in clinical psychology from University of Washington, postdoctoral with Dr. Anne um, Streisgroup, who is, as you've heard, the 
pioneer in this area. Um, and Natalie has um, published over 40 peer-reviewed articles and book chapters on FASD, and she and colleagues in 2007 found FASD Experts, which is a group of experts who travel around um, the U.S., giving um, expert um, assessments in capital and other felony contexts. In 2021, her book, Evaluating Fetal Alcohol Spectrum Disorders in the Forensic Context, was published by a very prestigious Swiss publication house, um, Springer. Springer. Um, and I, I think she, you're working on other issues uh, at the moment. Thank you very much. Thank you, Francis. Um, I've got a very brief presentation for you that's um, going to be very uh, practical in focus um, today. On the back table, there is a handout, a checklist of um, behaviors that you commonly, we commonly see in the forensic context when we are evaluating um, folks. And as Francis said, all over the United States, um, my colleagues and I have been working since 2007, um, and I've been working since 2005 in this, in this field. And um, most of those cases involve capital murder. Um, I would say about 98% of those cases. So the, the characteristics on this checklist that um, I've made available to all of you um, are both based on our experience and also um, they've been documented um, in a lot of um, peer-reviewed um, articles. So experiential and also uh, evidentiary. Um, the checklist contains um, four different uh, sections. One section is about the offense itself, the characteristics that we typically see in the offense context. And um, we don't always see the same pattern as um, many of you may know. There's no specific profile, um, sp definitive profile in terms of behavior for FASD. Um, there is a lot of variety with this condition, which makes identifying it somewhat difficult, not impossible, but challenging. So I have included on this checklist um, a couple of the characteristics, um, kind of contradictory characteristics that we typically see in this context. Um, the next section is on what it's like to work with a defendant who has FASD. So those of you who are attorneys in the room might be interested in, in some of the characteristics we see as we travel around the country evaluating these folks. And um, another section is on um, prior offenses, what we typically see in the way of criminal histories. And um, Justin, I really appreciated your, your comments. That was excellent, by the way. Um, and um, so that might be helpful in helping you identify as you go down the checklist um, qualities or characteristics that you might see in your clients. And then finally, the last section is on um, uh, what we see in the research in terms of evidence-based behavioral characteristics in FASD. It's not an all-inclusive list. This was meant to be a, a relatively easy to, um, to use one-page checklist. So it is one page. And of course, the more items that you have on the checklist, the more likely uh, you, are, you are to have a, a defendant uh, who has a, a, an FASD condition. Um, I won't go through those items as I indicated. I think uh, Julian Davies touched on several when he spoke earlier this morning. I also have, in addition to this checklist, for anyone who's interested and wants to contact me via email, um, I have developed another um, one-page checklist that it contains um, behavioral items. And this is strictly behavior that you see throughout childhood across the lifespan, typically the, um, the childhood years and the juvenile years in individuals with FASD. And this is a compilation that comes straight from the literature. And, um, and then I also have um, a handout on how to evaluate birth mothers uh, who may have given birth to, to a child with FASD. And this is not meant to be used as a checklist, but it contains very useful information and specifies the kind of um, details that we as evaluators need in our work. And I'm uh, talking about we, let me identify who the we is. 
Um, I do the developmental piece. I review records across the lifespan and uh, address why the FASD matters, why the diagnosis ultimately matters to the court, jury or judge. And I work with, uh, typically I work with Paul Connor, neuropsychologist, the only neuropsych in the United States duly trained on both neuropsychology and FASD. Paul and I met when we were both doing postdocs with Ann Streisguth back in the mid-90s. And um, I've, as I said, I've worked with Paul in almost every case. Um, we also have Julian Davies on our team and um, been working with Julian uh, since the early 2000s. And um, he is a di one of the three diagnosticians, diagnosticians that we work with. And we also work with Richard Adler, a psychiatrist in Seattle, a forensic and clinical psychiatrist. And Rich does a lot of the neuroimaging. He oversees the neuroimaging that we, more day, more, as time goes on, actually we're seeing more and more neuroimaging in these capital murder cases. And then finally, Ken Jones, the grandfather of FASD, who discovered fetal alcohol syndrome back in 1973 with Ann Streisky, among others. So um, we all, five of us, actually worked together in the Parkland school shooter case. And um, we, um, we often come together in various combinations in these cases. So that's our team, and uh, those are the checklists. So if you want to contact me for the additional checklists, drnataliebrown at gmail.com. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Brown. Um, next, we'd like to hear from Steve or Stephen um, Greenspan, who's a developmental psychologist, a professor emeritus um, of educational psychology at the University of Connecticut, who is known for his work on social competence, especially gullibility and what he calls foolishness or risk unawareness behavior. His work on FASD is an extension of his widely cited work on intellectual disability and in a seminal paper with Dr. Brown, uh, he and Dr. Brown describe FASD as a form of intellectual disability. Um, in addition to his academic writing, um, he testifies in criminal cases and he's currently writing a book uh, with uh, attorney Karen Steele and Dr. Brown um, on, uh, for Springer Publications on the Parkland, Florida shooter case um, where severe FASD was never diagnosed until the trial and based mainly on the FASD diagnosis, a death sentence was not imposed by the jury. And I think we actually have somebody from that jury in this room today, so um, very um, interesting, and as you can see, the interplay between the slightly different expertise, um, Steve is going to um, come at FASD from just a, a slightly broader, different perspective, I should say. Thank you, Steve. So... Uh... <clears throat> One uh, definition of a psychologist is somebody who studies things they're bad at. So I study social incompetence for a reason. For example, I thought I was going towards the end, so I was almost in the bathroom when, the, when my name was called. <laughs> and uh, I thought <clears throat> that my talk today was a legal competence only to discover to my horror last night that it's actually on Sunday. <laughs> so I've been up since like three or four this morning writing my talk for today. <laughs> well, I appreciate that, but actually I took a shortcut. I was going to talk about social competence, which has been my topic for a long time. but. Uh, I knew that I didn't really have enough time for that, so I cut and pasted from a long article uh, that <coughs> Natalie and I had worked on along with the attorney Billy Edwards, who many of you know, on the issue of uh, severity. 
and uh, <clears throat> I cut it down from 50 pages to 25, which is about three times as long as I can present here. So I'm kind of going to wing it a little bit. <clears throat> but I did write it up, and uh, I'll be happy to send it to anybody who wants to see the full presentation. So you can just send me an email, and I'll be happy to send that to you. And uh, <clears throat> my email address is Stephen, S-T-E-P-H-E-N dot Greenspan, G-R-E-E-N-S, P as in Peter, A-N, at uh, gmail dot com. <clears throat> so uh, I've been uh, lucky to uh, work with Natalie for several years now. We've done a number of publications in addition to the Parkland book that's uh, coming out. <clears throat> and uh, Francis said that we, our most cited paper was on uh, FASD as a form of intellectual disability. That's not completely accurate. We talk about FASD as a form of disability, intellectual disability equ equivalence. Uh, and uh, I see that as uh, a general characteristic of uh, people with other developmental disabilities. So I'm extraordinarily interested in FASD, but I'm interested in all, a lot of other what I call uh, naive offenders, people with developmental brain damage. And uh, actually, uh, FASD can be considered a form of TBI. It's, but it's TBI that occurs in utero. Uh, so part of my mission is not just FASD, but to create greater awareness uh, in the legal community of the role of other kind, various kinds of uh, developmental brain, brain disorders. What first got me into doing forensic work was a case in Connecticut where I lived at one time. <clears throat> Richard LaPointe, who was born with uh, Dandy Walker syndrome, which is a congenital disorder caused by a cyst in the uh, cerebellar, cerebellum, which blocks, in the wipes out the vermis, the central part of the cerebellum, and also blocks the uh, <clears throat> opening where cerebral final fluid can leave. So it's a hydrocephalus condition that causes all kinds of physical problems, but also uh, cognitive issues. And it was a, a false confession case. Uh, there was no evidence that he committed the crime. No one believes he committed the crime. Uh, actually, uh, we had Dr. G. Johnson evaluate him. And Gisley G. Johnson is the famous uh, British psychologist who uh, developed the Johnson's suggestibility scale. And so he evaluated him and said he's, his problem wasn't so much suggestibility, but he's got a kind of a wise ass sense of humor. So when, uh, very sarcastic, and so when the uh, detective said, you, you killed uh, your wife's grandmother, didn't you? His response was, yeah, sure I did. And of course they took that literally and sort of jumped on it. So, uh, I, how does this relate to severity? <clears throat> if you looked at uh, his IQ, it didn't quite qualify him as intellectually disabled, but he functioned very much like someone with FASD where the average IQ is in the low 80s. But in terms of uh, executive function, which is a much more important indicator of intelligence, he had significant problems. and. Uh, Certainly, uh, well, when they brought him in, they put stuff on the wall, and they signed it Sergeant Joe Friday. Do you remember him? And that was a character in uh, Dragnet, which was a big show in the 50s and 60s. <laughs> and uh, it, was, it should have been pretty obvious to anybody that, 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 that all the evidence they put up there was was phony, but the U.S. Uh, system allows uh, interrogators to lie, and uh, we counted about 20 lies in the interrogation of him. But uh, he was extremely gullible, which has been a big interest of mine over the years. Anyway, uh, just 
to backtrack a little bit, I'm a developmental psychologist. I've been studying social competence for many years, uh, and uh, particularly in people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. I didn't know anything about FASD, even though it's the number one known cause of intellectual disability, like most of my colleagues in uh, the intellectual disability field. Uh, I knew nothing about it until I got a call one day from Billy Edwards. Billy is uh, a, a public defender in Los Angeles who's a member of, uh, who was a member of the president's uh, committee on back then what was called mental retardation. And uh, he got interested in FASD and connected with folks up here, Natalie and uh, others, uh, Kay, Kay Kelly. And uh, so Billy called me call, uh, out of the blue. I didn't know him. And said, do, uh, do you want to uh, find out something about FASD? Uh, I made the mistake of saying yes. And a, a week has not gone by in the last 10 years when I haven't gotten stuff from Billy. Unfortunately, Billy is quite ill, so he's not able to be here. I hope he is able to make it next year. Uh, so when the... Uh, U.S. Supreme Court uh, in the Atkins versus Virginia decision, which was 2004, outlawed the execution of people with intellectual disability. I started getting calls from uh, lawyers. I'm not trained as a forensic person, but I acquired quite a bit of practical experience. And uh, many of the people who I uh, evaluated, had FASD, I came to realize, probably about at least 20% of them, or more, 30 maybe. But uh, lawyers know nothing about it, for the most part, and judges too. Uh, Valerie McGinn, uh, from New Zealand, a clinical forensic uh, neuropsychologist, uh, has talked about a, a case she was involved in. Uh, where someone had diagnosed FASD, but the court, sy court system in New Zealand uh, w didn't quite know what to do with that. So they got, uh, uh, they actually got a brief or a, uh, a declaration from the uh, Pediatric Society in New Zealand where they said, uh, FASD is just another word for ADHD. It's not important. It has no forensic uh, importance. Valerie uh, testified to the opposite and she was able to s convince the judge that FASD is a serious condition. So severity is not just an abstract issue of interest maybe to clinicians, it's a, an issue that has great relevance to court systems. There was another case in the U.S. a year or two ago, Floyd versus Filson, uh, and Mr. Floyd uh, was uh, a man who uh, was discharged from the U.S. Army for incompetence and various kinds. And he uh, shot up a supermarket one morning because he wanted to know what it was like to kill people. And uh, so a petition was put in through the various levels of courts, state and federal. And the judge, I think it was a state judge, it was in Las Vegas, Nevada actually wrote in his report, uh, FASD is of no relevance because it's not a severe disorder, it's just another name for ADHD, which was assumed to be a relatively low severity disorder. I want to see how much time I have here. All right. So, uh, in a chapter uh, Natalie and I wrote along with Billy Edwards in this uh, wonderful book that she edited uh, a couple years ago for Springer, which is called uh, Assessing Ex FASD, Assessing Extent of Impairment of Individuals and Conditions. Uh, we have a chapter on FASD and the concept of on uh, determining disability severity level for FASD, assessing extent of impairment of both individuals and conditions. 
So uh, I don't have time to really go into it, but I'll tell you that the concept of severity, you think uh, you know what it is. I thought I knew what it was, but we really don't address it very well. Uh, usually we, we uh, in, in, in the FASC field, it's basic, subtypes are basically physical characteristics, but they're not necessarily always aligned with cognitive or behavioral impairments. Uh, typically, as in uh, ID, intellectual disability, the severity uh, signifiers are based on IQ levels. Uh, clearly, that was in, in, inadequate. Then they brought in adaptive behavior, which is very inadequate also. For one thing, it doesn't really get at social deficits, and that's the key to succeeding in the, co in the economy, in the, uh, in the community, but also staying out of jail to a large extent, the function of how socially aware you are, knowing what's going to get you in trouble, both in terms of breaking the law and in terms of a police situation. Okay, I'll try to wrap up. So uh, we came up with a, a method based on a competence model that I first published about 20 years ago. Uh, and basically, severe, and we also looked at uh, levels of support and services that people need, both forensically but also living independently. And then we came up with a, a way of uh, quantifying uh, severity by looking at both the uh, number of symptoms someone has, the number of, uh, uh, the, the number of uh, severity, the total number of uh, impairments someone has in terms of uh, deficits, but also uh, the number of uh, supports that people needed. And what we found is that ID is a very severe disorder. It's very much at the same level as uh, ID. As Natalie has pointed out in some of her publications, sometimes the more high-functioning high people have the most problems because they don't receive services, they're not seen as severe enough. But we also looked, they didn't use this method to look at individuals, and uh, we found that even though ADHD is a more severe, is a less severe disorder than ID or FASD, there are some individuals with FASD who have a severe disorder. Why? Because they actually have FASD, which as you know is usually not diagnosed. So uh, I'll wrap up, and again, uh, please send me an email if you'd like a, a copy of this paper. Bye. Thank you. Thank you very much, Steve. Um, now, the, the next speaker has been introduced this morning, but I'll introduce again. Um, judge Anthony Wartnick um, has served um, as a trial judge for 34 years. Um, nine um, as a limited jurisdiction court judge, followed by 25 years on the King County Su uh, Superior Court in Seattle. Um, he retired in 2005. Um, as a Superior Court judge, he was serving and presiding in juvenile court, family court, um, and he chaired the Family Law Department and Family Juvenile Law Committees. So he has a very long um, history, as we heard this morning, um, in these issues. And I'd like to point out that although he retired, he has been maintained within the community as an expert. Again, it's the concept of keeping the elders of the community in teaching um, and passing on what they have learned. Um, and I think this is very important. As you can see, many of us are over 70. <laughs> Not on this side of the table, but um, and uh, so it's it, it's it's part of the FASD community that we're bringing younger experts in and keeping and maintaining the older ones. So thank you, Judge Wartnick, um, for bringing us your insights. Thank you, um, which will include the, the criminal and the non-criminal. This is why we particularly wanted Judge Wharton to speak because he bridges the two areas. It's not all about criminal law. FASD, as we heard this morning, 
um, comes up in the family courts and in guardianship courts. And it's these courts where um, so often the issues are heartbreaking when FASD is not recognized. So thank you very much for opening us up to that area. Thank you, Francis. I might say I have a particular affinity to Francis because my mother's name was Francis. I'm not sure what my grandparents nicknamed her Frenchie or whether her friends did as she grew up, but uh, she was obviously the love of my life along with my life. Uh, I'm going to sit because I'm kind of used to doing that when I'm sitting on the bench and I have a lot of notes in front of me. Uh, and I'd like to start first by just telling you a little bit more about me so you know where I'm coming from that isn't in the, the uh, bio uh, that uh, you've been provided with. In 1992, 1993, I was doing a two-year tour of duty at our juvenile court facility. <clears throat> and one afternoon, I had an offender calendar. And I walked in the, chain in the courtroom, sat down at the bench. First case was called, an attorney gets up and says, Your Honor, I'm representing a client who has been diagnosed with FAE. And I think to myself, what in the heck is that? And he says, and I mention that because he doesn't have good attention span, and I'm probably going to be asking you to take many more recesses during the afternoon than you're used to doing, because we were on the schedule of one 15-minute recess in the morning and then another one in the afternoon. So it was a very enlightening experience. It was the first case in the state of Washington that came before a court with an actual diagnosis of a fetal alcohol disorder. <clears throat> As a result of that, I went to the chief uh, juvenile court judge and I said, you know, we've got a problem here. We've got something that uh, just came into court that we know absolutely nothing about and I described to her what the situation was. And she says, well, I want you to form a multidisciplinary uh, task force to establish protocols for uh, the determination of competency uh, to stand trial because of organic brain damage. And that task force was put together. One of the members was Dr. Susan Astley. And we finished that project. And no sooner did that happen when I got a call uh, from someone that says, the governor is forming an advisory panel on FAS, FAE. Uh, would you be interested in serving? And I'm sure that Susan had something to do with that, because those things just don't come out of the dark. I went to my first meeting and was selected to chair the uh, uh, advisory panel. And that was really the start of my uh, FASD journey because members of that panel included Dr. Ann Streisfoot, Dr. Sterling Claren, who I'm sure those of you in Canada are very familiar with, uh, representatives from a number of the tribes in the state of Washington, we had initially a teenager with FASD on the panel. Uh, she had to depart, family moved out, out of the, the community. And so we then had a young adult with FASD on the panel, along with a representative from March of Dimes and many other uh, organizations, including uh, act, current activist groups. Uh, we finished that report. And I had the opportunity to uh, uh, go around the state and talk to uh, public health agencies about uh, the old disorder and what our advisory panel had come up with, and then got assigned other responsibilities in the court. And it wasn't until 2004 when I was chairing the educational committee formed by the state Supreme Court for our annual judicial conferences that I got a call. And going back, I 
indicated Ann Streitquist was on the advisory panel. I get a call from a woman who says, Judge, you don't know me, but I work for Ann Streitquist, and she wants to know if there's a chance of putting together a training program for judges. That was Kay Kelly. And let me tell you, Kay is the greatest networker I have ever known. We've traveled together nationally and internationally doing trainings. And from there, I did my first training out of state at Lubbock, Texas for starfish. And that was because I attended a SAMHSA training the trainer program with Kay and met Susan Carlson. And Susan was asked to speak there and couldn't and recommended that I do it. And that's history. Beyond that, Kay and I went to New Zealand to speak at the annual national conference of youth court judges and then on to Australia where we did a number of trainings. And we met two psychiatrists, a husband and a wife, and they were invited to come over and get educated by Natalie and Rich Adler and Paul Conner. And I was invited to attend, that was in late 2007, early 2008. And out of that, I was asked to become the legal director of Fetal FASD Experts, which was the first established multidisciplinary assessment team in the United States. Did that until that formal entity came to an end and has been active ever since then in education and teaching. I teach, co-teach courses on special needs populations and forensic psychology at Concordia University in St. Paul with segments on FASD. Well, that's, I think, the primary background that I come from. In addition, just my interest in the overall subject of alcohol use, abuse, FASD, and other disabilities. My father was an active alcoholic until he died. Fortunately, he was a successful enough businessman that whenever he got a DWI conviction, he could hire a chauffeur. I have a son who was diagnosed mentally retarded when he was about 20 months old. And I have a grandson who was on the autism spectrum scale. So my entire adult life has been focused on issues revolving around those various subjects. I'm going to mention some things that tend to sound like they're just unique to the criminal law practice when, in fact, they do touch on other things. And one, of course, is competency to stand trial, which in the child welfare arena, certainly if you have a parent with FASD and you have memory problems and you have suggestibility and confabulation, we're talking about a parent who is not a good historian and who, unless you communicate in very concrete terms and you have to know that that person has an FASD, you're not going to get very far. So the subject here really is access and representation of people caught up in the child welfare system. Kay and I, along with a Kansas psychologist, did a five-day dog and pony show on 
uh, child welfare in the state of Kansas, going from the west side of the state to the far east end of the state. Uh, and that was quite a really excellent experience. The problems with regard to access and rep good representation really revolves around education and training. We've been fortunate here in the state of Washington <clears throat> that over the years, with the assistance of people like Susan Atley's team that does assessments, to have the uh, child welfare caseworkers educated. When I first started uh, seeing cases come up in child welfare, I was the one who was saying, wait a minute, because nobody in the child welfare system had recognized some of the characteristics and behaviors that come with that disorder. I still pro tem as a retired judge, and it is unusual for me to sit and not have at least one to two FASD cases come up on the calendar, and I'm not the one that's saying, hey, wait a minute, because our social workers now understand what FASD is, and they're the ones that say, hey, we've got a parent with who's with fetal alcohol or a child, uh, we uh, you know, want the court to order certain services that are designed to deal with their issues. And so we've been pretty successful here in that regard. From the standpoint of counsel and judges, there's a real need for uh, education and training. I mentioned that we did that for judges in 2004 and 2005. We did the first session with Kay, Dr. Streisquith, uh, Judge Carly Truman from Vancouver, and it was so successful that the judges said, we want to have a session next year at the Judicial Conference focused just on campus sentencing issues. But the problem is, when I retired from the bench in 2005, I left 51 colleagues behind. Today, only three of those judges are still on the bench. We have a whole new group of lawyers and have become judges who little, know little or nothing about FASD. We need to get them educated and you need to push that issue. Going beyond that, I did some Googling uh, about three days ago. There are only less than 25 universities and colleges throughout the Western world that I was able to identify that have anything in their curriculum on FASD issues. One is in University of Edinburgh, in England, and the other one is in Australia. We have only two universities in the United States that have any type of postgraduate education in FASD. One is Tulane Law School, and the other one is Harvard with a master's degree program. So we need to train. We have excellent resources. My dear friend Natalie, who edited the Evaluating Fetal Alcohol Spectrum Disorders in the Forensic Context, published by Springer International in 2021, could be the textbook for training lawyers and judges through continuing education. We need to bring in others from other disciplines into those programs, including caseworkers, probation, parole, uh, custodial officers. And we need to have a collaboration in that process with people in the mental health field. 
each of us, I think, has a responsibility to go back to our communities and advocate to the universities and colleges for the implementation of programs on fetal alcohol. Lados says professionals can do the job in part, but the education leading up to people coming into the law practice and mental health uh, field needs to start before they ever get here. So I think that's about it. Thank you. Thank you. Our last speaker um, today is Corey LaBerge. Um, Corey is a Canadian who's been working with individuals living with FASD for the past 30 years in a number of capacities. These include academic and applied research, such as a, a, as a cultural anthropologist, and I, I'd like to hear more about that, Corey. Um, he's volunteered as an inaugural chairperson of the FASD and Life, Life's Journey, which is a social service agency supporting individuals with FASD. And he has worked as a lawyer um, accommodation counsel for the Manitoba Office of Children and Youth, the representative for children and youth, the advocate. We're, we're, we're mixing things. Okay. That's okay. Corey is going to make sure that um, you, you understand. He was accommodation counsel for youth living with FASD, and he was also deputy chair of the Manitoba Office of Children's Youth Advocate. Um, he is also a social uh, registered social worker and currently working as a quality service analyst with Community Living British Columbia. Thank you very much, Corey. Thank you, Francis. Um, unlike uh, Judge Warnick, I, uh, I'm used to having to stand up when I talk, <laughs> or at least I used to be. <laughs> Yeah, I did, uh, I did start out in anthropology. FASD, uh, I remember it was like a, you know, a little paragraph, I think, in a psychology 101 textbook somewhere back in 1990, maybe. And uh, it stuck with me. And the truth is I probably could have went on, well, maybe not, you know, in terms of academics and in, in intellectually, I couldn't have gone on to do a PhD in psychology, but if I had, I don't think that, you know, it's a term that would have probably come up again, which I'll, I'll get to a little bit later. Um, so when I did look at it as an anthropologist, um, it was really just completely academic um, in terms of what, you know, drew me to it. Um, but it's sort of become uh, a huge part of my life. I feel like I've been living with FASD, so to speak, for many years and I've made many great friends. And in terms of the anthropology, I saw FASD as a technology of self and personhood. FASD is a technology of social relations. So working like a heuristic, right, it was diagnosis that allowed somebody to reframe the way that they understood themselves. It was a diagnosis that allowed the people in their life to reframe the behaviors, their interactions with this person. And at its best, we've talked in the past about you know a paradigm shift that can take place in terms of better understanding. Um, you know, a person that's living with this disability. But at its worst, it's just the label, right? So if I was a judge in a courtroom and counsel stood up and said, you know, Your Honor, my client has FASD, the first thing that I would think is, well, like, so what? <laughs> can, you, can you elaborate a little bit? Um, like, how is it relevant? And it's really important to bring good information to the process. I remember most of what I feel like I've learned about FASD hasn't been, you know, in all the various textbooks and journal articles and whatnot. It's been spending time with people and um, learning about, you know, their lives. Uh, because it's one thread, it's one very important thread, balance of all the others in this tapestry that's their narrative, right? 
And so I quickly learned when I was doing defense work in Manitoba, Manitoba is a prairie province in Canada, probably has the highest incarceration rates. It's incredibly racialized. Um, there's a lot going on there. And uh, so I remember, for example, I, I was working one day at court and referred a, a young woman, she's 12 years old, first time, you know, she, and she's in jail. It was for a bail application. And uh, I called her mom, I didn't know anything about her, and you know, just wanted to get a sense of what's going on in her life. And quickly learned that, well, you know, her 11-year-old sibling had died of suicide. She had found her older sister dead in a car with her mom from alcohol poisoning. Her grandfather just passed away. They were really close. Her dad's in jail. He's got an addiction problem. And it just, like, went on, right? And I remember feeling like, oh, like she's 12. Uh, I haven't experienced that much trauma in my life. Uh, and so, yeah, FASD is incredibly important, but it's, you know, a one piece. And I remember speaking to a parent, I was interviewing lots of parents, sort of kitchen table style conversations, and a parent said, you know, I find this really helpful, this really works. And the next day I'm talking to another parent, and then I asked, have you ever thought about it like this or tried that? And all oh, that would never work for somebody with FASD, right? because it's a none of one, and, 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 and so there's, it can serve as a heuristic, but we really need good information in terms of the way that it's presenting for this individual, and the only way that we can do that is through getting assessment information and learning from the individual themselves and the people who know them, who are best positioned to provide information about their lives. So in terms of some generalizations I could make, um, you know, Clients with FASD more likely to have difficulty remembering office appointments, more likely to be transient, forget to notify their lawyer if they move, know how to have mail forwarded, may have difficulty with literacy, struggle reading or understanding court documents or correspondence. I worked with uh, uh, a lawyer who did family law at Legal Aid, and you know he would get a new certificate, he would send out a few letters to the client, and if client didn't contact the office and make arrangements for appointment, you close the file and move on, right? Um, more likely to have difficulty understanding, remembering, following through with the lawyer's expectations, understanding the nature of their legal problem, their lawyer's advice, compromising their ability to instruct, understanding and complying with court orders, having co-occurring mental health disorders that can complicate challenges, not likely to have a formal diagnosis, not likely to know that they're impacted by FASD may not have very much insight into how they're affected even when they know that they're impacted by it. Not likely to tell their lawyer about it. May not be aware that they're not understanding their lawyer's advice. Might confabulate, attempt to save face. I know I'm going on a huge list here, but <laughs> it's not important to write down. I just want you to think about the ways in which this disability can act as a barrier in terms of accessing justice, right? may require a support person who can facilitate their understanding of participation, not just within the court proceedings, but even with the lawyer-client meetings. It may require unique types of evidence to have their disability accommodated, and not likely to appear to the police, defense counsel, crown, prosecutor, I should say, maybe the court, to have any kind of disability or require any kind of accommodation. So it wasn't uncommon for me, like, the reason I brought up about, you know, a little blurb in the psychology textbook, I have had worked with so many clients who you know, had been in the mental health system, for example, for years and seen psychologists and psychiatrists, had a whole handful of diagnoses of the DSM, and nobody had identified that, in fact, they had an intellectual disability and were qualified for community living. Nobody realized that they had, you know, a disability in conjunction with all of these other behaviors. So in terms of some of the factors that can put, you know, Clients at risk. I'm glad that Justin had mentioned school. Um, in my experience, in, in, in speaking with people, it's been you know quite an abusive experience for many students. Um, getting punished for behaviors that you know that normally you think of discipline as should be corrective, right? But if you're sort of using punishment, negative reinforcement, whatever, and the child doesn't really understand why they're getting in trouble. Um, 
they, it, it really is, you know, they can't correct the behavior and just becomes abuse. I know it's a strong word, but, so they're frequently misinterpreted in terms of behaviors, labeled as non-compliant, aggressive, problem students, troublemakers, bad kids, which can get internalized, like Justin was saying. And that can increase the likelihood of, you know, uh, less healthy pro-social uh, preoccupations. Um, you know, when you think about the peers that people are involved with, there's a lot of struggles for a lot of kids with maintaining, finding healthy peer relationships and they end up with a lot of the time engaged with antisocial peers and get them in trouble, and they desperately want to fit in, so that's a problem. There's poverty, impulsivity, I mean, and I don't want to focus on all the, you know, <laughs> all the reasons that I think you know why people get uh, involved in the criminal legal system with this disability. Uh, a couple of things that have come up that I wanted to focus on was executive functioning that was referred to earlier in terms of the individual's ability to uh, come up with, you know, a plan where they can implement it and anticipate the consequences. Um, communication is huge. It's been referred to as a communication disability, a communication disorder. Um, and going back to the school thing, I can remember interviewing a young woman who, um, she described getting in trouble with the principal and the principal's you know, talking away at her, he's angry at her, he's whatever she's done, but she couldn't, he was speaking too fast, so the words were just washing over her, she couldn't keep up, couldn't process, right? There's a lot of issues around receptive and expressive communication, so this young woman, you know, she's just, uh, she can't really uh, process what he's saying, but his lips were moving, and it struck her as kind of funny, so she started to laugh, that didn't go well. Um, you know, so this behavior, getting interpreted as being maybe oppositional defiant or not taking it seriously or whatever. And it had nothing to do with that. It's her ability to process that, that uh, communication. And you can imagine the same thing happening in a courtroom. Um, language, incredibly important. I uh, felt really foolish one day. Um, I, was, I went to the youth center, got a client, he's remanded, he's in custody. I go in, just let him know I'm there, I'm like, hey, I'm here. Um, I'll be right back, I just need to get the particulars from the prosecutor. And I said, did you make a statement? And he said, no. And I'm like, oh wow, because that's like, that never happens, I always make statements. So I went to the Crown, got the package of disclosure, and sure enough, there's this DVD video of him with a full confession. And uh, I came back, I'm like, dude, you know, you said you didn't make a statement. He said, I didn't make a statement, all I did was talk to them. So, yeah, um, so much of the language. And the problem is that a lot of this stuff um, even though there's some safeguards, theoretically, like we heard police officers talking this morning about, you know, having to be careful in terms of language around right to counsel and what, they're supposed to understand this in order to exercise it, but in reality, it doesn't matter a lot of the time. In reality, you've got some kid who's with the police, they can use the read technique or whatever they, you know, into, that came up this morning into, or this afternoon in terms of being able to lie to them. Oh, we've, got, we've got you on video, your friends all ratted you out, we've got your fingerprints, your DNA, whatever, right? And get the person talking. And um, at the end of the day, if you have this person who's charged with these offenses, and uh, most of the, you know, a lot of the people that I work with, uh, they would usually either end up ultimately bail denied because they've breached so much. And so you might think, yeah, you've got a case in terms of, uh, they didn't understand their right to counsel, All right? So you've got a kid in jail and uh, you could get them out right now, you know, time served, or you can take it to trial, you know, a few months down the road. <laughs> hey, do you want to go to trial and sit here for a few months and see what happens or do you want to go home? So you know, this idea of the wrongful conviction stuff has come up, and really this tip of the iceberg in, in terms of the capital stuff, like, I, I really, 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 where am I for time? <laughs> okay. I'm inspired by the work that's being done around that, um, and at the same time, I'm troubled by the fact that, you know, we often, when we think about wrongful convictions, it, it is usually in the context of some, you know, homicide, somebody who's been sitting in jail and they didn't do it, but the you know vast 99.9% .9 of the stuff that people are convicted of is um, far less serious and, and never warrants any kind of 
uh, review. So I don't have much time left. So it's like, what do we do about all this stuff? Um, we make the system, right? Um, so the sad truth is that um, it's a bit of a crapshoot, right? If you get the right police officer and the right defense counsel and the right crown and the right judge, <laughs> things can go pretty right. Um, so, for example, one of my favorite stories, um, Pat Yuzwenko, who was, who was here earlier speaking, uh, I got this call one day, a random call, I'm just at work, and it's like, duty counsel at the Remand Center in Winnipeg said, I've got this guy here, he says he has FASD, can you come and see him? I'm like, sure. So I went over, and, uh, and that never happens, by the way. So I, first thing I said to him is like, oh, it's, uh, I'm really glad you, you mentioned that you have FASD. Um, why did you do that? And he's like, well, my lawyer told me if I ever get in trouble, I'm supposed to tell the police and the lawyers that I have FASD. And I said, oh. And this guy was caught in Winnipeg uh, with a stolen vehicle. And uh, he was from Alberta, like two provinces away. I said, who's your lawyer? He said, Pat. I'm like, awesome. So <laughs> first thing I do usually whenever I have a new client is I'll get the most expansive, broad consent to release of information that I drew up that's full of legalese and it's just meant to be a rhetorical document to try and get what I need for my client. So anyway, uh, I spoke with Pat and she, of course she had a whole bunch of assessment information and so I was able to go to court that morning with a package of information describing you know, all his strengths and challenges and background and whatnot. The judge that I was in front of, great judge, uh, very uh, compassionate and respectful and cares a lot about ensuring that justice is done for folks with disabilities. She made arrangements. She ended up doing like time served. Pat made arrangements for like a bus ticket from Winnipeg back home for him two provinces away. The judge had corrections actually take him to the bus station. And that, so he, yeah, it was, that normally would never happen, right? If he didn't open his mouth, uh, he probably would have sat in custody for a while then been released to the streets in Winnipeg. Right? But luckily his lawyer had, had mentioned that to him that it's important to talk about, and he lucked out. Um, so in terms of, I guess I'll wrap up with saying what do we do, uh, there's this notion within children's rights of CREA, children's rights impact assessments, and it's borrowed really from environmental impact assessments, right? So I think that it's important that we all audit the ways that um, our practice can constitute a barrier to access to justice for people living with this disability. So for example, and as a legal aid doing an intake, you know, just ask, do you have a disability, do you have FASD, do you have you know, a disability, do you have a mental health diagnosis, whatever it might be. If you don't do that, first of all, you miss a ton of people. Second of all, uh, it gets awkward, right? <laughs> Should I ask this? Shouldn't I ask this? But if it's just across the board, it's just part of the intake process. And um, ensuring that you have key people to help support. So most lawyers don't like having parents and other people involved with you know, meeting with the clients and stuff. If I was talking about like what really happened or something, which you usually avoid, um, sure, you're not going to have maybe somebody who there could be called as a witness or something. But if it's in terms of trying to explain the court process, what's going on, where things are at, uh, yeah, of course I don't want a support person there. I want somebody to be able to help translate the conversation because some of the language I might be using might be inappropriate. And I want the client to remember later. I don't want them walking out and then forgetting maybe something important that was spoken about. So if they can get support, uh, then it can be a better conversation. Maybe they have questions that they want to ask of me that they might not remember to ask while they're meeting with me if it wasn't for the support person with them. So that's been incredibly important. Assessments, it's difficult to get an FASD diagnosis. We all know that. And it's important to network. So for example, if I was asking for a uh, court-ordered assessment, uh, I couldn't get necessarily a complete you know, FASD diagnosis, but I knew the uh, psychologists that were doing them. And you know, he said, ask for functional assessment. And he would do all the psychometric testing uh, you know, I would get information about communication, uh, executive functioning, um, adaptive functioning, all that stuff. 
he would do exactly what he would do for an FASD diagnosis so that I could bring that information to the courts because that's really just critical. Anyway, I better wrap up. <laughs> uh, I would just like to think that, uh, yeah, everybody take your role seriously. Uh, think about how you can audit your own practice, then expand that to your organization, where you're working, and then maybe your profession uh, and interprofessionally. I know it's important, education has come up. Um, so in Manitoba, when I was there, we were talking about FASD at the Children's, uh, Children's Bar Association, Criminal Bar Association, uh, to try and create opportunities just like this for counsel to learn. So anyway, thank you so much for your interest and attention. Really love you guys. Take care. Thank you, Corey. We, um, we have um, a few minutes for questions, not many minutes, but um, since we're going to be going 10 minutes a little bit. Thank you, yes. I wanted to ask Natalie, um, is your screening validated? And if it's not, does that make any difference? And in addition, um, it says on here, uh, birth, uh, ask if the birth mother abused alcohol. Uh, how often do you get a yes on that? And if you don't, I know for NDPAE, you have to have documented use of alcohol, which then doesn't lead to a medical diagnosis. Does that, um, although I can understand from Corey that maybe just the, the profile suggests FASD, could you um, discuss that a bit? Uh, yes, sure. Your first question, can you hear me? Um, your first question was about validate the um, items on the checklist being validated, did you say? Okay, yeah, um, many of them are, actually most of them are, but some are experiential based on, on uh, the team's experience, my team's experience working around the country in the capital murder context. So some of those things have not been written about, but there, it's only about maybe five to eight percent of the items on that list. And in terms of uh, birth mothers, um, it's across the board. Um, we see, um, it's a, there's really no good answer to that question. It's a great question, but um, there is um, such a variety of presentations. Um, in many cases, we, we don't have birth mothers who are alive. Um, and uh, in other cases, we don't have birth mothers who are willing to participate or can even be found. Um, many of the folks we evaluate are in foster or adoptive care. Um, and um, so we use proxies to get that information. And um, we have um, the attorneys uh, actually work with us in interviewing witnesses, family members, and so forth. People who have, may have seen the birth mother during the pregnancy drinking once or twice or more often. Um, so witness information in affidavit or declaration form can be very good proxies. Another proxy method is to use records. Uh, if we can get the birth mother's um, medical, mental health records, if they're mental health records, and also her criminal records can be very helpful. Um, in some cases, we've had uh, birth mothers who have gotten a, a DUI around the time of the pregnancy. In the Parkland school shooter case, we had um, uh, an arrest when the birth mother was about six months along in her pregnancy. Um, she was arrested for cocaine possession. Uh, and there was an abundant amount of information about her drinking behavior, some of it self-reported by her, in the adoption records. So um, it's a variety. Um, oh, <laughs> Tony's reminding me. One of our earliest cases in Texas involved a, a birth mother who um, who was reluctant to um, report and and. Um, Stigma has already been noted by at least one speaker. Uh, stigma, stigma really affects how much disclosure we get from, from birth mothers and from family members. Um, and uh, in this Texas case, the birth mother was not forthcoming initially until we located a picture of her with her husband in Germany drinking a stein of beer uh, during her pregnancy. So that kind of opened her up to being more disclosive about her, her alcohol use. The, the most, most often what we see is birth mothers who are 
under-reporting. If they're willing to report at all, they're diminishing or decreasing the amount of their actual alcohol use because they feel guilt, shame, and, and so forth, uh, even though in, in um, my interviews, uh, I normalized that kind of behavior. Birth mothers and even doctors knew nothing about fetal alcohol at the time of the pregnancies of most of our clients. So um, that, that often can help um, get more disclosure. Uh, did I answer your question fully? Hopefully. Okay, we have, um, we have about three minutes left um, in our time, and I'd like to take a question from this side. Thank you. Thank you. This is for Corey and Justin. I'm a public defender in Grants Pass, Oregon, and I am exceedingly interested in making sure that I'm, my, I'm not providing barriers for people. So my question is, is it helpful or not helpful to write things down for people? I found that in my practice that works for some, but I'm not sure for FASD. Sure, hello. Um, write things down for them in what regard, may I clarify? For uh, upcoming appointments, upcoming court appearances. Absolutely. Okay. Yes, 100%. Um, as I stated, you know, um, in the other room adjacent to us, where we're doing a memory precon as well right now, and as Corey stated in his, um, you know, in his talk very well and very plainly, is that that's one of the biggest things. Your your client's not there. Where are you? Oh, you've moved. You didn't inform us. Oh, all you know, and this is very typical behavior for FASD, right? And it's the area where we need, I don't know, if it's we're still using this terminology, but the scaffolding, the external brain, the help. Um, we need it from, you know, family members, caretakers, those around us, just as Corey stated as well. Once you receive a diagnosis, you're able to reframe the way you think and approach everything from not just legal, but medical, everything part, you know, that's a part of your life. And so if I were to get into trouble again, right, the first thing I'm telling my lawyer is that I have a disability. It's called fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. The likelihood of them knowing what it is is going to be little to none. Um, and so I'm going to take all the time that I can to try and inform them of it. So, hey, if you call me and I don't call you back or you haven't heard from me or I'm not at an appointment, I need extra help and reminders. And, um, yes, writing that stuff down can, I think, can be pivotal in, in the way that you're getting help to individuals with a, a disability. Yeah, I'd agree with that. And I, 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 like Justin was saying, not only writing it down, but maybe usually I would always get at least two key contacts. <laughs> that were pretty reliable, if I could, whether it was a parent, caregiver, social worker, somebody that would be able to get a hold of this person and keep them informed as well. So. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. thank you for the question. It just highlights how with the practical, the practical solutions here, we need to have a whole day on practical solutions for effective representation. The, the last question, is it a fairly quick one? Thank you. Natalie, this is for you. How do we keep these kids from falling through the cracks? I don't understand why when a foster kid's in the system, they know mom's a drug addict and reports of alcoholism, why it's not required that they test these kids for fetal alcohol. It wasn't until I adopted her at nine that I got the assessment on my own. And it was because I was an RN and I worked for a pediatrician who pushed me in that direction. And so did you say, was that a question the, for- Why is the state not making them get these kids assessed? Why is it not required for kids in foster care system? Do you know? Yes, and do, who, to whom were you directing that? To Natalie. To Natalie. Oh, thank, thank you. I was just thinking Tony could answer that very well. Um, it, 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 it takes a systems approach. You've got to start with the schools. Um, and they fall through the cracks there. And they fall through the cracks there. You've got to start with the doctors as well in the training. And uh, as Tony mentioned, um, for mental health professionals, there's virtually nothing right now. Especially in Eastern and, Washington. And so, um, As they go to the autism center. I know, and, and, and so um, there's no simple answer, but, but there are so many communities that have to be reached and educated that it's, it's just a, an overwhelming amount of education that has to be done. So you have to start small at the community level and um, and uh, I think, uh, as, as Justin or maybe Corey mentioned, ex ex expand out from your own circle and, and try to broaden that circle. And that's, that's really the only feasible way of doing this. 
um, unless there unless there is some I mean, some miracle in terms of the law or something like that that gets passed, it's not likely right now. But uh, expanding your own circle is really um, the most effective way each of us can start. And Steve, do you want to add? Yeah, so very briefly, uh, just very briefly, I'm uh, involved in a, a book coming out for school psychologists. Actually, I think it just came out uh, called the Cambridge Handbook for School Psychology. And uh, I used to chair the school psychology program at the University of Connecticut, also the special ed program. <clears throat> so I have a chapter on intellectual disability, and I have a small section on FASD. And I, I recommended to the series editor that they solicit a chapter on FASD. And the response I got was, it's a rare disorder, and school psychologists will never encounter a child with FASD, to which I responded, they encounter them every day, but they, they're labeled ADHD or emotionally disturbed or something else, other health impaired. So I mean, that's an example of the kind of ignorance we're talking about. I, because of my son, uh, got involved first as a uh, co-president with my wife of a preschool that was started in Bellevue, which is right across the lake from Seattle, uh, when he was just under two years of age, uh, early education. And then later on, I uh, rejoined that organization uh, as a board member. Uh, and it took me five years to convince the director that it was time to start looking at fetal alcohol, and now they are one of the strongest organizations in King County uh, in providing services on behalf of the Department of Social Health Services in the child welfare system. But it takes time and it takes hard work and it takes, you know, to continue hitting that hammer on. Well, thank you. Thank you for a question which um, reflects the frustration of many people who, who see the gaps in this in the system, uh, the many, many gaps. So um, I want to thank all the uh, participants in this panel for their, for their work. Um, and uh, we now have uh, a coffee break for 15 minutes and um, back for the next panel which um, is panel four, innovations and challenges in the juvenile court system. So enjoy your coffee and see you in 15. Thank you.